it's a very important staple food in Africa and it's also a very important crop in Asia and Latin America. Cassava is highly desired for two principal reasons from the point of food security. A cassava is believed to have that inherent capacity to grow under marginal environments from two points. Ability to ad adapt under water stress and ability to produce with low soil fertility. But it does not mean that cassava cannot respond to high soil fertility and good moisture conditions. Cassava is highly flexible in production and it can be harvested any time between 7 and 24 months. If you look at the biomass produced by cassava, it's much higher than other crops. So it can stay on the field all year round. But for other crops like cereals, between 3 to 5 months they are out. But cassava will remain. It opens opportunity to be able to utilize and maximize your land throughout the whole year when other crops are taken out. Because generally farmers do intercropping. That is the first point. The second point is that a lot of lands that are considered not suitable for other crops, and these are lands in the dry regions, they cannot be opened up to agriculture if they can be planted to a crop like cassava that is well adapted to drought. That is one advantage it has. And with changes in the climate conditions, it means therefore that if you want to ensure that food security is not threatened, you need to enhance the capacity of such crops further through genetic improvement. And that is why cassava is so very important. Compared to other crops, it is considered relatively cheaper because most farmers who are poor do not have the necessary resources to grow crops intensively. And cassava oftentimes is classified on that category, even though cassava can do well when commercialized. So for farmers who do not have the resources, they find it cheaper to grow cassava. And of course, the canopy also means that they can smother wheat. So under traditional setting, it is considered the choice crop for food security. It's a heterozygous crop. It's an outcrossing species. And the typical genetic stocks you have in self-pollinating species do not exist in cassava. And even in some crops that are outcrossing species like maize, they have inbred lines. Those makes it very easy to carry out genetic studies. They also help you to rapidly move in your breeding program and explore development of hybrids. But those things are not there in cassava. That could partly also be because it has not been researched for a long time as other older crops. That is being addressed now with additional funding. It therefore opens opportunity for us to have more tools that can really aid the breeding of this crop. Significant progress is being made, but we still have a lot of challenges. The biology makes it also very difficult. In breeding, you need to create genetic variability. To make crosses in cassava is also very challenging. You don't have enough flowers. In maize, you can have about 300 seeds in a plant, but in cassava, you barely have 15 to 20, which shows that the ratio of the seeds generated is about 1 to 15, and the multiplication, because it's vegetatively propagated, means it's also slow. So those things make the breeding cycle very long and challenging. First of all, you need to understand the crop you are dealing with. You need to understand the genetics, you need to understand the heritability of the traits you are working in, and the information you get from such genetic studies will help you take the right breeding decisions, how you draw up your schemes, and then how you also handle each trait in the breeding program. Now with the advent of molecular tools, you can easily do these things. In the past, we didn't have access to genomic resources. But in the last 15 to 20 years, that has changed with a lot of donor support by different organizations like Rocky Feller, Generation Challenge Program, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that are all driving strategies that can really help move cassava. And we're also borrowing technologies from other crops and applying them. One is the need for a lot of markers in cassava. The first genetic map was developed in 1997 
and it was believed to be 80 percent saturated then but then saturating that map was a very big challenge but with the coming in of SSR markers and also SNPs of late that is now gradually changing so molecular markers are now helping us to fill all those genomic gaps and now with the draft sequencing of the cassava genome that means there's ample genomic information that we can now apply to understand the evolution of the crop itself. Because we now have those molecular markers, it means that we can actually modify breeding from the conventional concept into modern breeding. That means applying markers into breeding. We cannot do marker-assisted fracross. We cannot do marker-assisted selection. We cannot do marker-assisted recurring selection, which the Generation Talent Program is driving. There is also the new drive to move to genomic selection. So those things offer great opportunities to cassava. Recently, we've already started seeing that uh, new varieties developed using markers are now helping to drive the breeding programs. We've seen the first cassava released with the use of mass that help, helped us to transfer a very useful material from Latin America and is now being deployed in Africa. Initially, it was traditionally a food crop. However, over time, given the capacity of cassava to grow very well in the tropics and given recent developments in several countries like Asia where it is considered principally as a crash crop. Countries like Africa where it is principally seen as a food crop are now beginning to change the uh, paradigm. Cassava can be used to improve the income of farmers. So like Nigeria for example, the uh, current minister for agriculture is trying to improve the cassava value chain open up markets and try to promote among farmers the need for them to see that this crop can offer a lot of opportunities to them. So in the industrial sector, of course, yes, Nigerian government now passed into law that uh, flour millers use 10% of cassava flour for bread making. So it's useful in HQCF, high quality cassava flour production. It's been also useful in ethanol production. Of course, dry chips are also very important because that's one of the easiest ways they can ship it to other countries where they can be used for ethanol production. There is also the aspect of the possibility of using it to develop sweetness. It's, it has many opportunities in the industrial sectors, but this was not very visible in many African countries. But now, so there's a lot of campaign, a lot of awareness, and it is seen as a, a very vital key to expand the crop's potential and improve production. So it has a very strong base in the industrial sector. The challenges you have are principally biotic. You have some viruses in East Africa that are not in West Africa. For example, if you look at the cassava mosaic disease, we have the Ugandan variant too, which was responsible for the epidemic we had in East Africa that ravaged cassava. You have uh, the East African cassava mosaic virus, we have the African cassava mosaic virus in West Africa and the interaction of those two viruses can also be a problem. So it means that uh, when you read, you need to take into consideration that factor. Then you also have the cassava brown streak disease, which is a virus that you have in East Africa, and it's rapidly expanding. Uh, it's spread from East Africa to Southern, moving into Central Africa, not yet in West Africa. That is also very devastating. So the breeding program will need to factor in those differences in the biotic stress. For example, the breeding program in West Africa will principally commence with evaluation for cassava mosaic disease. But in East Africa, it will combine both East African mosaic and CBSV. And to do that, it means that if you are going to breed, you must integrate those two viruses before you can start evaluating for other major traits. Uh, in terms of abiotic stresses like drought, I think the same ap approach can be applicable. If there are no differences between the jump plasm, I believe the jump plasm in East Africa will be more adapted because they may have been selected over time for that region and those in West Africa. But again, efforts are also going to ensure that those jump plasm are accessible to partners wherever it is needed. very devastating because Nigeria is the leading cassava producing country in the world and it feeds millions of people. In every six Africans, 
you have one Nigerian. So in terms of the threat to the population in West Africa, it's unimaginable. But again, I think there will be need for concerted efforts between West and East Africa to collaborate so that we can learn from problems in East Africa and apply it to the situation in West Africa. We can avert what they went through. It will essentially require what you call preemptive breeding. Preemptive breeding means that we should start breeding for materials in the absence of that pathogen. But that will require a lot of input from East Africa having germ plasm like Namikonga and new materials that they have found tolerant to the disease. So we must improve diagnostic protocols to be able to explore those useful germ plasm. And we need to look for partners, virologists, breeders in East Africa to work with so that we can start developing the necessary germ plasm that can be used to improve the germ plasm we have in West Africa so that we can mitigate the effects of virus when it spreads. It also means we need good collaboration among quarantine agencies among countries so that movement of germ plasm can meet strict standard procedures in the deployment of germ plasm. Because one of the easiest ways to spread disease materials is to carry materials that do not meet standard quarantine procedures. for cassava is bright and is ever going to be bright because several years back it was thought that nothing could happen in cassava and we had to live with it that way but experience has shown that that's that's not really true because in recent times a lot of improvements have been recorded in cassava and that is principally because technology is improving molecular tools are now available previously we were breeding only for root yield targeted mainly for food but now we have industrial opportunities in cassava. It means that we have to look for some key traits. Ensuring good nutrition for people who consume cassava is a priority. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been supporting that. Now we have beta carotene cassava. We're also looking at reducing post harvest physiological deterioration. The dry matter contents, increase in starch or quantities, all these are key traits that can really improve the commercial value of a crop and cassava is becoming very important. So I think there are big opportunities for cassava. More importantly is that Africa has the environment to be able to cash in on that opportunity and explore cassava as a big crop to compete with other crops like wheat, potato, and rice, which are considered the prime crops in the world. It can because once you improve cassava for qualities for which other crops are desired, it will be seen as a good substitute in the markets.